Hello everyone, welcome to Euro PCR 2024. My name is Dejan Milosinovic and I'm joined here by two friends. Tomas Koise, course director, and Davide Capodano, editor-in-chief, your intervention. Our task today is provide to you the Euro PCR 2024 coronary highlights. We know that Euro PCR is about the community getting together and we do have today more than 12,000 participants. However, what we try to do is connect the education and the practical segments of our profession with the new science. I would like to start with Thomas. Thomas, what is new on the education front in terms of intravascular imaging? Yeah, indeed, Dayan. We've seen that a huge interest in the community about training and education on imaging. And we had for this 2024 edition, the new Imaging Learning Center which was a place dedicated to training and education. But importantly, the attendees not only see others doing imaging, but we had workstation. So meaning that people were able to be trained doing imaging themselves, and then to bring that next week in their own cat lab. And I think that's what will really make the difference. And obviously also we've seen a lot of imaging used during coronary cases in the main arena. So we have a clear increased interest for intracoronary imaging, which is probably coming from all the recent evidence suggesting the benefit for the patient. That's very good. I mean, education is very important. We know that the adoption of intracoronary imaging depends both on good education, yeah. but also on continuously providing more data about it. Davide, was there any studies dedicated to imaging this year? Yeah, that's the beauty of EuroPCR uh, this year, but also previously that brings uh, practice, but also science. Uh, and talking about uh, intracoronary imaging, we have seen the results of the Dr. Lethman study, which after the October study in bifurcations, uh, exploring OCT versus angiography, now tackles specifically the Lethman bifurcation and compares these two uh, strategies, the intracoronary imaging and the angio, on an endpoint which is physiology post PCI. But very interestingly, I would say uh, we have seen a malapposition, which is decreased by the use of OCT. We have seen uh, that the distortion can be seen and then corrected. So there are uh, uh, information coming from these uh, smaller studies that are very precious and complement what we know from the largest. Yes, one. I agree completely. I mean, especially about the stent distortion following the results of the October trial, we recognize that's a very important point of life main PCI and having imaging there helps you detect and correct it. Toma, another hot topic, calcium. What was there yeah. that was new? We see more and more patients coming with calcified lesion. We know that those PCI are challenging with high risk of complication, suboptimal result, impaired clinical outcome. But we have tools to optimize. We have dedicated devices to tackle the calcium. We have new imaging modalities. And following that, an important part of the meeting has been dedicated to education and sharing practice on calcified lesion. We had simulation-based learning, we had learning session, many learning sessions dedicated to management of calcified lesion, and interestingly, we had two live cases in main arena, one from Toulouse and one from Leipzig, dedicated to the management of these calcified lesion. So we had a lot of education and sharing about calcified lesion. Thank you. David, besides the different devices we have for plaque modification, it is also important to understand when to use which device and to understand calcium in general. So were there any studies this time about the tackling of calcium and understanding how to treat these patients? Yeah, let's say to address your question, I would say that uh, imaging is key to understand where the calcium is located, circumferential, uh, just uh, a calcified nodule, so you need imaging. And there was a nice study from France uh, uh, this year at EuroPCR, which is called Calypso, and they really tackled the calcified lesions, which is a, a, a proportion of patients in other trials, but this is dedicated, so they look very carefully on what happens in terms of minimal stent area after uh, a PCI and of course no surprise imaging in this setting as well was uh, uh, more effective in allowing you to have a better stent expansion. So it, as, as it was promised at the beginning at the opening ceremony imaging was the overarching topic of the course. Uh, moving on a DCB attracts a lot of attention. What can you say to Matt to us in terms of practical tips and tricks? What was shared during Euro PCR? Yeah it's interesting that's a clear big trend let's say in coronary intervention, beside uh, imaging as we, as we already discussed. And really the number of submission that we receive in both abstract clinical cases 
and also LBT based on DCB was just amazing. And we've seen that almost in all live cases, we had proposal from the audience asking why you are not just treating this de novo lesion with DCB. <laughs> yeah. But interestingly, I think we have, just as a word of caution, that's a time where we have a slight disconnection between practice, and we see more and more de novo lesion treated with DCB, and the evidence, because as of today, we don't have evidence uh, to justify or to validate the use of DCB in de novo lesion. So I will probably, there is a great enthusiasm, that's probably a nice new option, but I think for de novo lesion, we have to wait for more evidence. David, it's your turn. So when we speak about evidence in the space of DCB, what was new this year? Yeah, let's say, I agree, we await for the results of trials that really tackle the novel lesions, but in the meantime, it's interesting to see that we are trying to address other questions that are pertinent to these devices. For example, dual antiplatelet therapy. No one knows which antiplatelet therapy to use. Actually, we do something that our experience and practice and consensus allow us to do. So in this year, there was REC cage free 2 which was a study coming from China, and they look at the stepwise strategy of de-escalation. So basically they gave DAPT for one month and then they switched to the monotherapy with the clopidogrel and then they switched again to aspirin. So a little bit complex in a way, but it's the first study showing that this may be beneficial to patients, so at least non-inferior and perhaps reduce bleeding. That's a very good news. And following up on that, there is also a hybrid strategy. So it's not only DCB versus stents. There is also a possibility to combine the two treatments. Were there any studies this year about that? Yes, definitely. So this was one of the highlights, I think, uh, in terms uh, of the coronary space. Uh, so uh, Ability uh, Global is a large study, perhaps the largest in uh, DM patients, uh, around uh, 3,000 patients. And they look at the device, which is hybrid, as you said. So it's a stent, but there is drug also on the balloon uh, and so on the shoulders of the balloon. So this uh, is uh, expected to decrease the edge effect uh, of uh, stents in diabetes. Unfortunately, this was not the case, at least uh, with the learning curve that we have uh, with this new concept, because it's uh, not a DCB, it's not a stent, so perhaps that was the issue and science was uh, again the uh, comparator and uh, it was better. I think it's important what you mentioned, there is a learning curve to any new concept that we have and to apply in the cat lab and this might apply to this as well. Davide, Thomas, thank, thank you very you much for idea. joining. Colleagues, thank you much for joining Europe PCR 2024.